Good evening. Um, welcome to Stories of Greatness. Uh, this is our second um, Mendoza story and pretty much as, as predicted we're not going to get close to, to finishing Mendoza's tale uh, in, in two. So we'll, we'll see how far we get. I'm going to try and keep this one relatively short because what tends to happen is I get a bit carried away and my camera stops filming. So hopefully that won't happen this time. It's always a bit disappointing that I've got to go back through it and work out where, where I stopped being filmed and what I hadn't said. Um, so anyway, Daniel Mendoza, one of the, the, the greatest fighters to, to ever step into the ring. When we last left him, he was, he was a teenager and he'd just been given the sack by his employer because he'd taken a fight for money, uh, not for moral purposes. Um, so Dan was young, he was feisty to say the least, and he was unemployed, his time was his own. So what he did is he got together with a group of his friends and went off to celebrate a Jewish festival. Um, he doesn't say which festival, um, but from the impression we get, this is a festival that lasted several days. Um, and for some reason, we've no idea why, the group of them decided to go to this festival in fancy dress, to dress as, as sailors. Uh, and Dan was to be the lieutenant, the officer amongst them, but they were all going to dress up as sailors and go off to this, this festival. And they did, and, and they, they had a great time. And they, they possibly had a little bit too much to drink. Who can blame them? Uh, and, and on their way home, after the first day, they were sadly accosted by a press gang. Um, and at this point, the what one of one of the greatest pugilistic careers of all time was almost cut completely off. Um, it almost never happened. Um, what you've got to bear in mind is at the time press gangs were pretty common. Um, they weren't quite as aggressive as as popular culture would lead you to believe, and um, they didn't kind of wander the streets grabbing anybody that they could. Um, that was strictly illegal and impressing was not illegal as long as the press gangs stuck to seamen, to seafaring men, people that had knowledge of the sea. Um, some 25 years later at the Battle of Trafalgar, the, the British Royal Navy, not the Merchant Navy or any, any, any other form of, of, of seafaring men, but just the Royal Navy, consisted of 120,000 men, um, which is a phenomenal amount, and that's, that's exactly why the, the British Empire was as successful as it was, why the British Navy was so successful, and it had this massive, massive amount of, of, of seafaring men who it could draw on at, at times when it needed to, and sadly for Dan, at that point we were, we were indeed at war with the French. Um, out of the 120,000 men in the, the Royal Navy at Trafalgar, over half of them were impressed. So they'd been effectively picked up by a press gang and taken on board ship, and they hadn't managed to escape. Thankfully for us, Dan and his friends did manage to escape, but even with his fighting prowess, and the fact that they weren't actually seafaring men at all. They were young Jewish teenagers dressed up as sailors. It still took two days for them to get away. But get away they did. And they got back to the festival and they had a lot of fun and they made fools of themselves and it was all, all a bit of a disaster. But it, it really wasn't, wasn't a, a big deal. Dan had a lot of fun um, and that's what he was after. Uh, shortly afterwards, he, he entered the service of a tobacconist. Um, he needed some money, he didn't have any, he wasn't from a rich family, um, so he wasn't of independent means. He had to, to, uh, you know, to find some way 
of, of paying his way in life. So he took a job as a travelling salesman for a tobacconist, effectively travelling around between London and the South Coast and, and, and all around the, the South of England, taking samples of the tobacconist's wares and attempting to sell them to gentlemen. Um, he didn't do hugely well as a salesman, but better than you'd have thought. Not long after taking the job, he was passing near Chatham, uh, and there was a military barracks there. And on the, the road outside the barracks, Daniel was accosted by a sergeant of the 25th Regiment of Foot. Now, there's a theme that runs through Mendoza's life that you've got to be aware of, in that he was always accosted by people. Now, it's possible that he was clearly and obviously Jewish, and that led people to be very rude to him and to accost him. Um, and I'd hate to disregard that as an option. But it's also possible that he was really, really very touchy indeed. And I suspect the latter to be quite, quite true. Doesn't necessarily mean that the former isn't also true. Um, but anyway, the two of them had a bit of a set to, with words, they were arguing. Um, at which point the sergeant hit him with his halberd. Now, I can only assume that he hit him with either the butt end or with just a blow with the stick, because being hit by a halberd is going to make a, well, it's going to make any, any sort of day into a bad day. Um, at which point Dan immediately challenged him to a fight, as you would expect. You can see various things building here. Dan gets into a, an argument with somebody, challenges them to a fight. Um, now this, this sergeant was significantly older than Dan and significantly bigger and stronger than him, as you would expect, as most people seem to be, um, and agreed to fight very, very readily. So a ring was formed and the two of them stepped in and, and they fought. Uh, it, it lasted for, for almost an hour but Dan effectively destroyed him. Uh, again, as you would expect. Uh, he, he hit him again and again and again, and he took round after round. And he took very little damage himself. And at the end of the fight, when the sergeant-at-arms eventually gave in, refused to come up to scratch, one of the officers of the sergeant's own regiment came up and told Dan he was, he was so impressed with the way he'd fought that he wanted to gift him five guineas. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, uh, bear in mind that, that, was, that was a huge amount of money. That was effectively uh, a week, a week and a half's worth of wages for Dan at that point. Um, not only that, but he put in a large order for some tobacco. Um, the tobacconist job didn't last very long. Um, it, it didn't pay hugely well. And Mendoza had kind of developed a bit of a love for the finer things in life. And he needed more money. So he, he took a job that he'd been recommended to by some friends that was going to pay him well over a guinea a day, that was going to provide him with his own horse and lodgings. Um, he was particularly impressed by, by this job. It was fantastic. Um, he was effectively just going to be riding down to the coast, picking up some goods and bringing them back to, to be sold. Um, and he was kind of employed as a guard. Only after a couple of days he realised that this was highly illegal. That he'd effectively been employed by a, a ring of smugglers and was, was the, uh, the guard for illegal smuggled goods. Um, and now he was quite happy to, to get into fights with people, but he wasn't particularly happy to risk his life for someone else's money. Um, and when he found out a couple of days after this that the person whose job he'd taken had been killed um, by customs officers, he effectively walked away. So it left him without work yet again. Uh, he decided to, to walk to Northampton. Um, which is quite a long way, but the reason he did that is because the champion of the day, Tom Johnson, was to, to be fighting uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Love, and Mendoza really wanted to see this fight. 
So he and uh, I believe one of his cousins set off very early and they walked all the way to Northampton and they got there in time. Uh, and um, the fight disappointingly only lasted five minutes. So everybody that had travelled from London to watch the fight was a little bit disappointed. Um, to cut a long story short, Mendoza managed to catch a lift home. And on the way back, he got into three separate fights with three completely different people. Uh, the first one he was very eager to get into, and he, he, he beat the guy very, very easily. And a gentleman who happened to be passing gifted him some, some, some money and got some more from the crowd and got him about eight or nine guineas. Uh, the second fight he tried hard not to get into because he was suffering a bit after the first one, but you know, he, he did anyway because let's be honest, he was Mendoza. Um, it earned him even more money. The third time it happened, the people who he'd got a left with effectively abandoned him. Through one way or another, of course he won the fight, um, he ended up also managing to get one of the horses of the friends of the guy he'd just beaten in the fight. Um, so he rode back to London on someone else's horse with about 18 guineas that he didn't have before and effectively when he got back to London proceeded to get horrifically drunk, have a fantastic time and leave the horse tied up in some random street in London for this guy to find. Um, he says in his own memoirs that he's fairly certain that the horse did get back to its owner. This is kind of how Mendoza's life went for a little while. Uh, not long after that, um, he moved to Northampton to set up a confectionery business. And it, in the long term, it didn't work. But the move proved to be quite a good move. Um, because while he was there, <laughs> yeah, unsurprisingly, he got into a fight with the local bully. Um, he, he was being pushed around a bit by this guy and challenged him to a fight and went to the local local inn and was if, was told that this guy was actually a pretty good fighter. He was a fairly skilled pugilist. Um, and that maybe being that Dan was so much smaller and and so much younger that, that probably it wasn't a good idea. Um, but he wasn't doing it for the money. He was doing it because he was annoyed. So he, he fought this guy and, and, and beat him very conclusively. Uh, so conclusively that the, his opponent's father, bizarrely and unexpectedly, completely befriended him. Uh, it, it seemed that the, the, the elderly man had always disapproved of his son's behaviour, but hadn't really been able to stop him. Uh, and he very much hoped that Daniel's thrashing of him would teach him to change his way and invited him to move in with them and he did for a little while. He moved in and became friends with the, the gentleman he'd fought with uh, but the business didn't work and he moved back to London uh, and on that note that's where we're going to leave it for now. Um, my guess is we're about 10 minutes in and that's pretty much as far as I want to go for now so that's Mendoza part two. You can see themes developing. Uh, there are a lot of instances, and I've missed several out, and I've glossed over several fights, um, where Mendoza is offended by somebody, challenges them to a fight, they have a fight, Mendoza wins. That's kind of the way it goes, and he earns a bit of money. But what we can see is over this period of time, Mendoza's trying very hard to maintain the, the role of a man of business. Um, but finding himself more and more becoming a man of his fists. And um, what we'll find in Daniel Mendoza Part 3, that this begins to come to the, the notice of the great and the good, and those really very senior members of the fancy, and Dan starts to make more and more of a, of a, a very comfortable living. But anyway, I, I won't preempt it by telling you anything about that. You're just going to have to wait for, um, for number three. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you've got comments, please do let me know. 
um, stick something down below in the comments. It's really nice to, to get a bit of a conversation going after I've made a video like this. Um, stick a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. If you have subscribed, make sure you click the little bell next to the subscribe button because if you don't, you won't get notified when I'm putting out new videos like this. Uh, if you're able to support me through Patreon, that would be fantastic. Martial arts is my living, teaching it, talking about it, writing about it. These are all things that I do in order to try and make ends meet. Um, so if you're willing to support me on Patreon, that would be fantastic. And um, I'll see you soon. Take care.